webinar, the South American Geometry webinar for the day. Um, today we have our colleague Professor uh, Rui Tojero from São Carlos. Um, can we uh, have a look at the slides? Because you don't appear to be sharing. The... Yeah, I, I will put in the presentation more okay. now. But first, let me thank you for the invitation and all the remaining organizers. It's a pleasure to give this talk here at this nice webinar. And I hope to participate in it more regularly from now on. Cheers. So I will put in the presentation mode now. Go ahead, please. In the meantime, Luis, can we have the instructions on the chat? So soon everyone is going to see the instructions to join, to subscribe to our mailing list the uh, WhatsApp group for announcements, and also the link to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can also subscribe to us directly by following the uh, following link to the Google agenda so that you don't uh, miss any of the subsequent seminars. Um, yes, we, please go ahead. Can you see the, the screen right no, now? Not quite, no. Oh, oh I should. Maybe I did something wrong. What about now? Now, yes. Now we're good. Okay. Can you all see the, the first screen of the talk? So, so. Yes. Nice. So I hope at least you, at the end of the talk, we will understand what the mean, what, what's the meaning of the uh, <laughs> title name, infinitesimally bonnet bendable hypersurface. I, I, I hope at the end of the talk, at least you you understand what this means. So this is a joint work with uh, postdoc Miguel Jimenez, uh, which is here for a couple of years. And the talk is based on a joint work with him, which is to appear in the Journal of Geometric Analysis very soon. So the subject of the talk fits into this fundamental problem in submental theory, which is to investigate which data are sufficient to determine a submanifold in a space up to some group of transformations. Of course, a basic example of such a problem is the so-called isometric deformation problem, which asks which submanifolds are not determined up to ambient isometries only by their induced matrix. In other words, it's the problem of uniqueness of isometric versions of a given remaining manifold into some space form, for instance. So a bit of terminology, an isometric immersion is said to be isometrically rigid if any other isometric immersion of the same remaining manifold into the same Euclidean space, say, is a composition of the original isometric immersion with some rigid motion, I mean, an isometry of the Euclidean space, in which case we say that the two isometric immersions are congruent. This is the right meaning for an isometric immersion of a given remaining manifold to be unique unique up to some isometry of the ambient space. Those that are not 
isometrically. Rigid are said to be isometrically deformable. For instance, surfaces in Euclidean three spaces are always locally deformable. And uh, well, the very first result about the problem in higher dimensions is a result by this and Keeling, which gives a necessary condition for a hypersurface to be deformable, which is the existence of at most two principal curvatures, uh, two non zero principal curvatures at every point. There are similar algebraic condi conditions on the second fundamental form that imply rigidity. Uh, one of them are by Allen Duffer, which is based on a concept called type number of the immersion. And there are some other alg algebraic conditions introduced by Ducarmo and Deicher, which are the so-called S nullities. I will not go into details into that. I'm just mentioning that there are sufficient conditions of an algebraic nature that imply rigidity. So, of course, a deformable submanifold may admit a one parameter family of isometric deformations. Well, let us be more precise. We call a map from the product of, uh, of an open interval containing zero and a remaining manifold M into Euclidean space, we call it an isometric variation of a given isometric immersion F from the remaining manifold M into the Euclidean space of dimension N plus P. Uh, if at time zero, it coincides with the given isometric immersion F, and for each t, it gives another isometric immersion from the same manifold into Euclidean space. Of course, such an isometric immersion may be trivial. It may consist only by rigid motions composed with the original isometric immersion f. We are we are, of course, interested in the case in which the original isometric immersion admits non-trivial isometric variations. Well, let me recall another uh, standard concept that will play a uh, significant role in, in what follows which is the so-called relative nullity of an isometric immersion. Isometric immersion. It's just the kernel of the second fundamental form of this isometric immersion. In other words, at each point x, we look at the vectors tangent to the manifold at that point for which this equality holds for every other vector at the same tangent space. In other words, the kernel of the second fundamental form as a bilinear map into the normal space at that point. The dimension of this subspace, if it's non-trivial, is called the index of rel relative nullity of the immersion at that at that point and it's a standard fact that on any open subset where this index of relative nullity is constant and positive this defines a smooth distribution which is totally geodesic which means that each leaf is a totally geodesic submanifold of the manifold M, and moreover, each of them is mapped by the immersion F, 
into an open subset or kind of fine subspace of the Euclidean space. So the manifold is foliated by open subsets of a fine subspaces. Well, for a hypersurface, the relative nullity subspace is just the kernel of the shape operator at that point. Can I ask you something real quick? Sure. So um, do we know that it's locally constant? That the, 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 yeah, the on an open dense subset, there's an open dense subset on each connected component of it, uh, the relative, the index is constant. Okay. The, the index is a, a semi, the, uh, uh, a lower semi-continuous function. So there is an open and dense subset on each connected component of each, it's constant. Thank you. Well, the, the, the difference between uh, N and the index of relative nullity is the so-called type number of the hypersurface, which is the same as the rank of the shape operator as the linear operator. So a few more definitions. We say that the hypersurface into Euclidean space is surface-like if it's either a cylinder over a surface in Euclidean free space, or I mean just the product, the, the uh, extrinsic product of the surface with a Euclidean factor, of dimension n minus one minus three, that is n minus two, or else it's a cylinder over a hypersurface of R4, uh, which is itself the cone over a surface in the three-dimensional sphere. These are the so-called surface-like hypersurfaces because they are determined by either a surface in Euclidean three space or a surface in the three dimensional sphere. Of course, such a hypersurface has always index of relative nullity at least n minus two at any point. Another definition, we say that hypersurface is ruled if it has intrinsically a totally geodesic distribution of co-dimension one, I mean of dimension n minus one, each leaf, each leaf of which is mapped diffeomorphically by the at the surface onto an open subset of an affine subspace. So it's again a hypersurface foliated by open subsets of a fine subspace. But these affine subspaces may not be subspaces of relative nullity. For instance, if you take a uh, uh, one sheet hyperboloid in Euclidean three space, it's a ruled surface, but the rulings are not uh, lines of curvature corresponding to the zero curvature. Other in, in other. Uh, the other case is a cylinder of, for instance, in which it's also ruled, and in this case, the rulings are uh, lines of curvature corresponding to the zero principal curvature. Okay, Th this is the difference. So let us say a few words about deformable hypersurfaces. This is a subject that has go goes back to 
the early 20th century by the works of uh, uh, an Italian mathematician called Isbrana. It's a student of Bianchi. And afterward, the same result was uh, given another proof by Cartan. And much later, we have also worked on the subject. We'll say in a few seconds what we have done. They have given a complete local classification of such deformable hypersurfaces into five classes. These three first ones are the less, interest, less interesting ones. The first class consists of the flat hypersurfaces, which are highly deformable, in other words, any element of this class may be deformed locally into another element of the same class. Then there are the surface like hypersurfaces whose deformations are given by deformations of the surface determined by uh, which determine the, hypers the hypersurface. The next class is formed by the ruled hypersurfaces. And then there are the interesting cases. Those hypersurfaces that admit an isometric variation of isometric deformations of the original hypersurface. And lastly, there are hypersurfaces which admit a unique deformation. In fact, in the classification by Sbrana and Cartan, this last class appears in the proof they give, they have given, but they have not been able to provide any example. So in this paper, uh, nine, almost 90 years or 80 years after the work of Cartan, we have uh, finally settled the question whether this last class really exists. We have given explicit examples of hypersurfaces in this last class. Okay, but we are in fact interested in this talk in the so-called infinitesimal variations. What does this mean? What, what we call an infinitesimal variation of an isometric immersion into Euclidean space is a smooth variation which preserves lenses just up to the first order. What does this mean? This means that the elements of the one parameter family determined by the variation uh, have the same induced metric as the original isometric immersion, but only to the first order, in the sense that the derivative, derivative at time t equal to zero of the induced metric is zero. The metrics coincide only up to first order. When we have, in general, a variation by isometric immersions, it's useful to look at the uh, variational vector field, which is this vector field along the original immersion given by the expression which is displayed at this last equation. You take the derivative at time zero of the curve you obtain by fix, fixing a given point x and letting the parameter t vary. This gives a vector field along the immersion which can be shown 
This is quite easy to show. Let us satisfy this equation. The Snabla tilt is the connection in the Euclidean space, the standard Euclidean connection. So it's useful. I think we have a question. Uh, Daniel has yeah. a question. Uh, yes, I mean, it's uh, this uh, infinitesimal variation is not generated by a uh, diffeomorphism, and this diffeomorphism is not generated by the Achillean vector field? It may be, but when it is, we have the so called trivial. Okay, I see. Variation. Okay, we I see. We are actually interested in the case, this is not the case. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's what I yeah. expected, but okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you made a, 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 an important point. That's a possibility that you just have uh, the, the variation of vector field in, given induced by a killing vector field of the ambient space, but this is the case we want to discuss. We are interested in the case the variation of vector field is not given in this way. This is what we will call non-trivial uh, bendings, is a word that will appear in the, in the next slide. So, the idea is to study infinitesimal variation by looking at the variational vector field they determine. So, we call a vector field along an isometric immersion, an infinitesimal bending, if it satisfies that equation that is always satisfied by the variational vector field of an isometric variation. This is what we call the infinitesimal bending. And it can be, of course, trivial. It can be given as the vector field that's induced by a killing vector field of the ambient space. In other words, it may be given just by applying a certain skew-symmetric endomorphism of the ambient space and adding a fixed vector. This would be the trivial infinitesimal values. We are interested in isometric immersions that admit non-trivial infinitesimal bearings. This is what's written in this sentence. And this other sentence uh, tells us that we may study infinitesimal variations uh, by studying infinitesimal bearings. Infinitesimal variation gives rise to an infinitesimal bending, and conversely. So, if we classify isometric immersions that admit non trivial infinitesimal bendings, we are doing essentially the same for the case of infinitesimal variation. So this leads to this definition. In general, we call a submanifold that admits a non-trivial infinitesimal bending infinitesimally bendable, otherwise infinitesimally rigid. This, these are the infinitesimal versions of the notions I started with of rigidity and deformability in a standard sense. This notion is also an old one. It has been widely studied by geometers in the 19th century. And 
this subject has been somewhat revived by the book of Spivak, who devotes several chapters of one of the volumes, I think the, 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 the last one, the fifth one, to uh, a modern treatment of that theory in um, some in, in a modern language, let's say. Let's say. Well, there are similar uh, necessary conditions for a hypersurface to be infinitesimally bendable. For hypersurfaces, it's quite the same as the necessary condition found by Bees and Keeling for a hypersurface to be deformable. It has to be at most two principal curvatures, two non-zero principal curvatures at any point. And Deicher and Ducamo and in the, uh, no, Deicher and Rodriguez have given the infinitesimal analogs of the necessary conditions by Alan Duffer and Ducamo and Deicher in this contest. And so the problem we will now discuss is the classification of infinitesimally bendable hypersurfaces. First, there are a sort of fundamental theorem in this contest that reduces the problem to the existence of a symmetric endomorphism B satisfying two equations. The first one is this one, which relates the symmetric tensor B with the shape of radar of the hypersurface. And the other one requires the tensor B to be a Kodazi tensor. This is what is called the Kodazi equation. And this is, has a converse which holds if the manifold is simply connected. Once you have such a tensor, it determines an infinitesimal bending of the hypersurface. So, when trying to classify infinitesimally bendable hypersurfaces, one is reduced to find, to investigate which hypersurfaces carry a symmetric tensor satisfying these two conditions. Can I ask you a quick curiosity? Sure. What if you try something canonical? So what if you take as, as a symmetric tensor, say, uh, the metric itself or the Ricci? Uh, do you have a sort of notion of a canonical infinitesimal bending you could? Well. Because you're saying any B, right? So you yeah. could say, oh. right? For instance, if you take B equal to zero, which would be the, <laughs> the trivial solution of both equations. What you can prove is what is in this last sentence of the slide. This would correspond to the trivial infinitesimal bending, which we want to discuss. So if you have, if you wish to have a classification, you have to determine all such possible tensor. Cool. I, I, I guess the point I was trying to make is that um, if you choose B to be some sort of canonical tensor, say let's say Ricci, right? Let's say B is the Ricci. Well, now, not necessarily the, the Ricci is the Kodazi tensor. Now, this is a, a special class of hypersurfaces that 
That is precisely. Okay, well, uh, yeah. To find an F, uh, the Ricci of which satisfies that relation with, uh, with uh, its shape operator is in itself a, 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 a difficult PD. <laughs> yeah, well, th th this is sort of an algebraic equation that involves both the tensor B you want to find and the shape operator. This is a differential equation, which yes. is uh, uh, harder to deal with. But uh, if you choose at random a tensor satisfying this equation, you cannot expect it to satisfy also the first one. You have to deal with both simultaneously. And of course. And uh, the idea is to use that the candidates of bendable, infinitesimally bendable hypersurfaces are always of rank two by the theorem of Cesaro, which says that if there are more than two non-zero principal curvature, the hypersurfaces, the hypersurface is automatically rigid infinitesimally. So we have to deal with hypersurfaces of rank two. So the idea is to see how the tensor B descends to the quotient space of the original manifold by the foliation of relative nullity and look at those equations in the quotient. That's the idea for the classification. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Uh, then so, has a question. Sorry, uh, algebraically, this is uh, highly uh, underdetermined or uh, or it depends on the dimension. What do you know? These two are these two algebraic equations. I mean, the, I mean, you have n for n minus one divided by two. I, I suppose a coefficients for b, and so you have two equations. And so, is there any relation between the dimension and the how over or under determined uh, of determination of the system, or that doesn't play a role? Well, I, I guess this does not play a role because. Uh, when you go to the quotient space, you can uh, reduce those two equations into two more treatable ones, and uh, which allows to a complete local classification. In fact, this is also an old result, which has been obtained by Isbrana himself the same one who gave uh, the, the first classification of uh, deformable hypersurfaces. And, uh, but he didn't treat all the possible cases and quite recently, Deicher and Vlahos completed that classification. And it turns out that the classes of infinitesimally bendable hypersurfaces contain, consist of the uh, same three first classes that appeared in the standard case of deformable hypersurfaces, but what I just say, uh, referring to as the interesting ones form a much larger class than the class of hypersurfaces that we mentioned before that admit an isometric variation. So this is was the motivation of the work I will now describe with the content of this talk. So everything I said up to now, is a review of known results on the subject that are related to the problem 
I want to discuss in this talk, which is related to another famous problem on surface theory, which is the Bonnet problem. So this is one of those problems that fits into that fundamental problem in the submanifold theory I mentioned in my first slide of this talk. Which data are sufficient to determine a submanifold in, say, Euclidean space? Everyone, everyone knows the so-called fundamental theorem for surfaces in Euclidean space. Of course, a surface is uniquely determined up to isometries, up to rigid motions by its induced metric and its second fundamental form. This is the classical Bonnet theorem. What Bonnet proposed himself was to determine which surfaces are not determined up to a rigid motion only by its induced metric and its mean curvature function, which would be a weaker requirement than assuming that the second fundamental form is known. So the problem is to look for the exceptional surfaces, those surfaces that are not determined only by their induced metric and their mean curvature function. And this has been studied by several of the great geometers of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, among Bonnet himself, Chan, Cartan, and some others. And the local results on this subject was that the class of exceptional surfaces regarding Bonnet problem are constant mean curvature surfaces, a family of surfaces which became known as Bonnet families. These are surfaces that do not have constant mean curvature, but admit the same induced metric, the same mean curvature function, but are not congruent. Uh, pairwise. And there are those surfaces which admit only one single other surface with the same induced metric and the same mean curvature functions, which form Bonnet pairs. And at the end of the talk, I will mention something that was still unknown until very uh, few years ago, and it's very likely it's a paper that appeared in the archive. As far as I know, it's not published until now. Uh, whether there exist compact Bonnet mates, I mean a pair of compact surfaces with the same induced matrix, the same mean curvature functions, and which are not congruent. So there is a paper in the archive that claims to have produced examples of tori with this property. But I, go, I will go back to this point at the end of the talk. Well, everything I said so far regarding the Bonnet problem was for surfaces, two-dimensional case. But the problem makes sense also for any dimension. Uh, which hypersurfaces of Euclidean space are not determined up to rigid motions only by their induced matrix 
and their mean curvature functions. And this was studied by a Japanese mathematician called Kokubu, who showed that aside from the flat hypersurfaces, the only exceptions in this case are surface-like hypersurfaces. We call that the notion of surface-like hypersurfaces that I defined before. Cylinders over surfaces in Euclid, in Euclid and three space are cylinders over hypersurfaces of Euclid and four spaces. Uh, and the hypersurface being a cone over a surface in this three dimensional sphere. So if we start with a solution of Bonnet problem, in Euclidean three space or in the Euclidean three sphere, and you build a space like hypersurface in terms of them, this will be a solution of the Bonnet problem in any dimension. And the only other class of solutions of Bonnet problem in this higher dimensional case are the so-called minimal hypersurfaces with type number two. I mean, minimal hypersurfaces that have only two non-zero principal curvatures. These are known to have, a minimal hypersurface with type number two is known to have an associated family, just a minimal surface in a Euclidean space does. For instance, you have the associated family that links the catenoids to the helicoids. You have a one parameter family of isometric minimal surfaces, which starts with the catenoid and has the helicoid at the other end. And this can be extended to higher dimensions and then give rise to another class of solutions of the Bonnet problem, which is uh, the only other class of solutions. Well, now we come to the subject of the talk. What we wanted to investigate was an infinitesimal version of the Bonnet problem in higher dimensions. This was motivated first by the fact that when you classify infinitesimally bendable hypersurfaces, the interesting class is much larger than the class of hypersurface that admit an isometric variation in the standard sense. So there might be more examples of what we now call infinitesimally bendable Bonnet hypersurface. Let me be more precise, more precise here. First, I will say that a variation of uh, hypersurface by immersions Ft is an infinitesimal Bonnet variation if both the matrix, induced matrix, and the mean curvature functions are preserved up to the first order in the sense that we only require that the derivative derivative at t equal to zero of the one parameter family of induced matrix and the one parameter family of mean curvature functions vanish at that point. Again, an infinitesimal Bonnet variation might be trivial and this happens 
uh, in the case we have a trivial infinitesimal variation as in the standard case. So we are interested in the non-trivial case, which are the hypersurfaces that admit a non-trivial infinitesimal Bonnet variation. This is what we call an infinitesimally Bonnet bendable hypersurface. And the starting point for our classification was to see what happens to the tensor B, which appears in that fundamental theorem determine infinitesimal bendings of hypersurfaces. The proposition states that an infinitesimal variation of a hypersurface will correspond to infinitesimal Bonnet variation if and only if the associated tensor B satisfies this extra condition of being traceless. So with this characterization, we have been already able to reprove a result that was known yet in the 19th century. In fact, at first, we thought we had a new result about surfaces. But afterward, we found it in Bianchi book, which says that being locally infinitesimally Bonnet bendable is another characterization of the notion of isothermic surfaces. Recall that a surface is isothermic if away from the umbilic points there are always coordinates local coordinates that are both isothermic this means conformal and have the property that the coordinate curves are lines of curvature of the surface we all learn in the standard ge differential geometry courses that one can always have in any surface local coordinates whose coordinate curves are lines of curvature of the, of the surface. And on the other hand, we all know that any surface or any Riemannian to uh, any two-dimensional Riemannian uh, manifold always admits conformal coordinates. This has been proven by uh, Gauss himself in the analytical case and then much later extended to the, the smooth case. But if you require both properties to hold simultaneously, then this only happens if the surface is isothermic, by definition. This is not true in general. But the class of isothermic surfaces is quite large. It includes constant mean curvature surfaces, any quadric, and uh, other important classes of surfaces. And they have this other classical characterization as being exactly the locally infinitesimally Bonnet bendable hypersurface surfaces. So this was a motivation for our work. As when classifying locally or infinitesimally Bonnet bendable hypersurfaces, we might be looking for a generalization for higher dimensions of the notion of being isothermic. 
I myself have tried to uh, find a suitable uh, generalization of the notion of an isothermic surface in higher dimensions and core dimensions in an earlier paper. So this would be another try. Summarizing the problem we were interested with, interested in is this question. What are the infinitesimally Bonnet bendable hypersurfaces of Euclidean space? So, of course, the strategy was to look for the classification already known of all infinitesimally uh, bendable hypersurfaces and look which of them are also Bonnet bendable. So infinitesimally Bonnet bendable. This is not so easy as it might seem, but uh, we have been able to solve the problem. And I will give you well, how, how, how much time I have? I can't see the watch. Well, we should probably wrap up now, I guess, uh, if you could say a few more things. Okay. There, there were so, questions in between, but so we're, we're basically over time. So I, I will skip this, the, 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 the sketch of proof. You can... <laughs> Take a look of it in the slides after warp. I will restrict myself to state the result we have obtained. So, what we have proved is the following classification. We assume the hypersurface is free of totally geodesic points, has dimension at least three. The two-dimensional case was a classical result. And what we have proven was that if you assume the hypersurface is infinitesimally Bonnet bendable, then, well, this is a local result. You can actually glue different types of infinitesimally bendable hypersurfaces. So, we have to state the result on an open and dead subset of the manifold. So, on each connected component of this open and dense subset, either of the following two conditions has to hold. Either it's a surface like hypersurface determined by an isothermic surface, in an umbilical hypersurface of dimension three of the ambient space, which might be the three-dimensional sphere or the three-dimensional Euclidean space, or it has to be, again, a minimal hypersurface with type number two. So the difference between the classifications of infinitesimally Bonnet bendable hypersurfaces and uh, infinitesimally bendable hypersurfaces, which was the result of Kokubu, was that instead of the surface like hypersurfaces being determined by a solution of the Bonnet problem, now it can be any isothermic surface. Notice that any solution of the Bonnet problem is a special case of an isothermic surface, but a very uh, restricted subset of the whole set of isothermic surfaces. So this is the theorem we have proved. 
And of course, it has a converse, assuming the hypersurface is simply connected, then uh, any of those two classes are infinitesimally Bonnet bendable. Well, in, in this in the first case, we have a slightly weaker conclusion, which is that we can only guarantee that the hypersurface is locally infinitesimally Bonnet bendable. But aside from this detail, uh, those two classes are precisely the classes we were looking for. Those infinitesimally Bonnet bendable hypersurfaces, which are just by just for reminding you, the hypersurface that admits a non trivial variation by isometric immersions that preserve both the metric and the mean curvature function up to first order. So I add here, just to finish, a few references. I separated the references regarding the subject. There, this is a, there is a large literature on the classical Bonnet problem. Here are some old and some new uh, results. This last paper is the one I mentioned before, which claims to have proved a long standing conjecture about the existence of compact Bonnet mates. They claim to have constructed two isometric tori, which have the same mean curvature at corresponding points. The Bonnet problem has also been studied, yet for surfaces in other ambient space. For instance, by Galvez, Martinez, and Mira in homogeneous three manifolds, and by these two Greek guys, Polymerax and Vlahos, for uh, surfaces in four dimensional Euclidean space and in general four dimensional space forms. Well, as for the isometric deformation problem, both in the standard and as infinitesimal versions. There are also some old and not some old uh, results. These three first one uh, from the beginning of the 20th century. The last three ones are more recent and well a bit of a different advertisement in our book you can find uh, an introduction to the basic facts about both the, the isometric standard the isometric deformation problem and the infinitesimal version of it this is the Bonnet problem for hypersurfaces in the standard form. And this is the reference for the main result of this talk, which is to appear in the Journal of Geometric Analysis. This is all. Obrigado. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank Hui, please. Have we got any questions, please? I think we can one question. Quick about it. Everyone? 
I well, mean, this, uh, yes. Um, Go ahead, Daniel. It's, it's just a. Uh, it, it seems that you were working just in core dimension one, right? If 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 you if you I don't know if you said something about this, but if you work in higher core dimension, what you get are replicas of this, or or, or you or you haven't explored that already? Well, we haven't explored. That. I think I think that first of all we should have the. The, the, the right assumptions that we should make, make. in four dimension greater than one. There are only two recent papers, but for surfaces. The Bonnet problem for surfaces in four dimension dimensional space forms. But in higher dimension and higher dimension, I don't know any paper on the subject. You, the first step might be rough, uh, to establish the the right assumptions to uh, what would replace the condition of uh, uh, assuming the same mean curvature functions. If we assume just that the norms of the mean curvature vectors be the same, I think this would be too weak a condition. So if you assume there is a parallel vector bundle isometry preserving the mean curvature vectors, maybe this is too strong a condition. So you should first uh, find which would be the right uh, assumption to be made. But until now, uh, as far as I know, uh, I only know these two papers by the Greeks, Olimeraks and Vlahos, which study the Bonnet problem for surfaces in four-dimensional space forms. So here the co-dimension is greater than one, but the dimension is two. This is only for surfaces. For submanifolds of higher dimensions, and co-dimensions, as far as I know, there is nothing still done. So this is the joy of mathematicians. There are always things to be done. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for my naive question. And it was a very good answer. Thank you. OK. Hui, maybe I have a quick question. It's just because uh, it relates to my question during the talk. Uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't get my head uh, rid of rid of it. So I'm, I'm going to somehow ask it again. Um, so uh, when you when you mentioned the compatibility relations between uh, uh, tensors A and B, right? So between the shape operator and some uh, symmetric tensor. Um, of course, then then you go in a different direction, right? You want to get to the Bonnet situation, but I'm, I'm still stuck at that moment. Well, we're just discussing uh, um, uh, sort of basic setup. Now, if, for every surface, right, for, for, for every submanifold, in fact, uh, if you give me an immersion, uh, well, it comes, it comes for free with the natural symmetric tensor, which is the Ricci, right? Which is only Kodazi if, the, episode, if the, the, the manifold is what's called a harmonic. Oh, I see. So, so you've probably already answered my question, right? Yeah, that, because that's that, where I'm right. So, yeah. so it is natural to ask when does the Ricci itself satisfy those relations, uh, Skodazi relations, relative to the shape itself? But that would be a PDE for a PDE on F, right? That's a PDE on the immersion. Yeah, that's right. But is this understood? Remember that in our problem, we only have to deal with hypersurfaces with 
uh, with rank two. The, the shape operator has rank two. So you can always parameterize such a hypersurface in terms of the so-called Gauss parameterization, mm. which is uh, given in terms of a surface in the sphere and a function that plays the role of the support function. So the idea is to descend those two conditions to the surface. Mm -hmm. So they become easier to handle in the surface than instead of the hypersurface itself. That's the usual uh, procedure to uh, give the classification. You don't right. walk. Mm -hmm. You don't walk in the hypersurface itself. You find some way of descent. The tensor. Sure. I understood, I understood your approach. I was just trying to say if the problem, like, sort of stated in general, in terms of the Ricci, if this is a naturally motivated problem to be studied. I understand it's not the problem you are interested in, right? You then go your own way. Okay. But uh, it appears to me that this would be a naturally motivated PDE on F. Well, the, the, the only property of the Ricci tensor being Kodazi leads to a very interesting class of manifolds, which are the so-called harmonic manifolds. This uh -huh. is the definition. This, this is a very well-studied class of manifolds, which is uh, which are very interesting by their own. Cool. Uh, hypersurface, uh, no, no, not uh, remaining manifolds, whose yeah. rich tensor are Kodazi. These are so the so-called harmonic manifolds. Yeah, which and are, are very they like well classified? Well, no, our, our classification, I, I think, is very uh, still yet out of sight. I, I mean, there are many results, but uh, uh, I think uh, one of the guys who studied this was Derzinski, which has done some joint work with Paolo Piccioni. Maybe Paolo mm -hmm. now knows uh, much about that. Uh, okay. Next time I meet either of you, I'm going to go back to this question because uh, it got me thinking. I'm, I'm, I'm now very interested in harmonics and manifolds. I didn't know I was interested before, but I, th I think this is something well, very interesting. What I can tell you is that there are many results about them, but they are far from a, a complete classification. Maybe in some special cases, but actually, I also not an expert on on this. I just it reminded me of the definition, and I remembered of taking a look of some papers by Derzinski, but they, they are somewhat old papers. Maybe there are some more recent. In, in Bess's book, there's a paper, there's some chapter dedicated to this class of manifolds. So, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe it's a good place to uh, know Start. the state yeah. of the art at the time of its <laughs> yeah. But I, it's probably uh, it's very likely that many other uh, results have appeared since then. But uh, okay, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, all right, so can we uh, thank Hui again for this uh, always knowledgeable uh, uh, exposition, please? And we'll see each other again in two.